But I was making a number of kind of crass generalizations about Americans that I don't really believe any of them. And I, I did it for comic effect. And I don't understand how anyone can have a kind of generalized view about another nation or race. I certainly don't. And I think it's because I'm, I'm different to a lot of you. I'm not necessarily better. I am. I'm different, and I'm better. Let's face it. But, I, but and I think it's because I I feel a little bit kind of removed from your human society because I'm actually I'm adopted. I'm an adopted man, and so I'm suspicious of notions of identity or nationhood. For example, I grew up thinking that I was English, right? But about two years ago, I found out. And this is true. I found out that my real father is Scottish, right? Which of course means. But I'm Scottish, because as you'll know, Scottishness is passed on through the male genes. <laughs> like a disability. And uh, it, it overwhelms all female chromosomes. And that's why there are no Scottish women. Oh, there's no Scottish women. <laughs> None there are men in kilts, but that's just nature trying to find its own level. <laughs> And if a Scottish man wants to breed, of course, you have to travel south of the border. Normally, you get as far as a major English railway station, get off the train, lie down in a gutter drunk, and hope some pollen lands on you. <laughs> and, and I can say that, remember, because I, technically, I am Scotch. <laughs> yeah, Scotch, yeah. Genetically, if not culturally. But I think that... Even though I grew up thinking I was English, I think I always knew that I was one of you, you know, because I'd go into school Monday mornings and people would go, Did you see the sport at the weekend, Stu? The brilliant sport that all men must like with England winning in it. It was good, wasn't it? And I'd go, No, in fact, it filled me with feelings of revulsion and disgust. <laughs> then they'd go to me, What about the rich tapestry, the tableau of English culture and history? Do you take no pleasure in that? And I'd go, No, in fact, the whole notion of English culture just makes me feel kind of mentally, physically and spiritually bereft. And they go, what about the English language, the tongue of Shakespeare, Shelley, Blake, Churchill, does that not stir some residual national pride in you? And I go, no, in fact, whenever I hear an English accent, I have to be physically sick. <laughs> and I would hear my own voice answering their question, and I would start vomiting as I spoke so I hate as a child I hated being English and yet conversely I always harboured secret cravings for shortbread offal and heroin <laughs> you know deep fried heroin if I could get it with sauce heroin supper 295 but so I think I always knew, Glasgow, I can hardly believe this is happening, I always knew that I was a Scotch man, and so I always knew, and, but, uh, yeah, Scottish, thank you for correcting me, sorry, uh, you know, it was an error I made on purpose for comic effect, and I'm glad that there's so little trust in me in the room that people are going, he's a fucking idiot, he doesn't know, he's insane, what's he talking about? He hasn't done the most basic research, but... No, but I always, no, even despite that, I always knew that I was Scottish in my heart, in my brave heart. I always knew that I was. Okay, shout out if you've seen the film Braveheart. You've all seen it. Shout out. Okay, now you'll know more than any other audience I've played in the last three weeks that Braveheart is the shittest film ever made, right? It was. It was directed by the reactionary Catholic bigot Mel Gibson, and it's full of basic fundamental historical errors which insult your race and mine by association, right? Here's, here's just three off the top of my head. Firstly, William Wallace Braveheart, your national hero, he wasn't some, you know, noble savage living in a mud hut. We all know that. He was a privileged, educated nobleman, right? Secondly, it's not mentioned by Mel Gibson in the film, but there's some evidence to suggest that he actually fought as a mercenary for the English as a teenager. That's conveniently missed out. Thirdly, you know that French princess? He's supposed to have sex with this French princess in the film, you remember? And the implication is that he gets her pregnant and she marries Edward II of England, so it's his kid. Now, she was a real historical figure, that French princess. But, at the time of the death of William Wallace, Braveheart, your national hero, she was only four years old. 
Now, Glasgow, I'm not saying... <laughs> ..but William Wallace Braveheart, your national hero, didn't have sex with her. <laughs> you know... He probably did, if I look. But my own personal background, there's a lot of sexual opportunism involved in it. But, um... Not saying he did now, so he probably did, but if he did, and he did, he definitely did, right? <laughs> it would have been a far less romantic scene <laughs> than the one enacted by Mel Gibson in the film Braveheart. It may have happened in a tent, but it would still have been not a romantic scene, because that would have made William Wallace Braveheart, your national hero, a paedophile. <laughs> A Scottish paedophile. <laughs> the worst kind of paedophile <laughs> that there is. Coming at you through a bothy. <laughs> with short red on its face. <laughs> muttering unintelligible sexual threats <laughs> in a frankly incomprehensible dialect. <laughs> But another weird thing about that film is, you know, in it, like, um, fine, leave at this point. Uh, it, gets, it gets worse. A man leaving there to go away and think about the idea of a paedophile Braveheart in the privacy of the toilet cubicle. 